Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. I want to thank first Ken Quiet Hawk for his amazing intro. He's a native storyteller, and among other things, he has CDs out there that are just magnificent. If you have never heard the natives, a native storyteller spread their spread their magic, please check him out on the internet. Just look for a native storytellers, and he'll probably be at the top of the list. Otherwise, look for Ken Quiet Hawk. I have an amazing man with me tonight. I have Brian J. Jones with me, and he's written a book on Jim Henson. And um, for those of you that, for those few of you who don't do not know who Jim Henson is and was, uh, he was the creator of the Muppets. And uh, Brian's book on Jim Henson is fascinating and inspirational and an incredible read. And um, I finished reading it a couple of days ago, and I just uh, I was amazed at the at the intricacy that he has portrayed this this amazing man. I'm going to let you. I'm going to read a little bit about his book to you because it truly is exceptional. This extraordinary biography, written with the generous cooperation of the Henson family, covers, covers the full arc of Henson's all too brief life from his childhood in Leland, Mississippi, through the years of burgeoning fame in America, to the decade of international celebrity that preceded his untimely death at the age of 53. Drawing on hundreds of hours of new interviews with Henson's family, friends, and closest collaborators, as well as unprecedented access to private family and company archives, Brian explores the creation of the Muppets, Henson's contributions to Sesame Street and Saturday Night Live, and his nearly 10-year campaign to bring The Muppet Show to television. He provides the imaginative context for Henson's non-Muppet projects, sorry, including the richly imagined worlds of the Dark Crystal and the Labyrinth, as well as fascinating misfires like Henson's dream of of opening an inflatable psychedelica nightclub, one I surely would have visited had I had had I even known there was a possibility of one of those in New York City. An uncommonly intimate portrait, Jim Henson captures all the facets of this American original, the master craftsman who revolutionized the presentation of puppets on television, the savvy businessman whose de- deal-making pr- prowess won him a reputation as the new Walt Disney and the creative team leader whose collaborative ethos earned him the undying loyalty of everyone who worked for him. Here also is insight into Hansen's intensely private personal life, his Christian scientist upbringing, his love for fast cars and expensive art, and his weakness for women. Though an opportunist, though an optimist, sorry, by nature, Hansen was haunted by the notion that he would not have time to do all the things he wanted to do in life, a fear that his heartbreaking final hours would prove all too well-founded. Brian is 
the critically acclaimed best-selling biographer of some of the world's most iconic creative geniuses, Jim Henson, Dr. Seuss, George Lucas, and Washington Irving have all been put under his meticulous microscope and demanding attention to detail. He presents insight and magic into the lives of these amazingly creative individuals and, pre- pre- sorry, and presents to us the flow of energy and inspiration that evolved into the creative gifts they have gifted humanity with. And perhaps, just maybe, even a hint or two of what their prog- process and their directions were and they came from. So, welcome to the show, Brian. Hi, Barbara. I'm sorry. Sorry I was so late, but it looks like nobody could tell because you were doing a wonderful introduction like always. <laughs> well, I always have faith. You know, it's kind of like, well, if he's <laughs> not here, at least I've had a run through. So, but, <clears throat> but, you know, it's it's this book was an amazing book. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that um, Henson was, um, a very unique man. Now, now you know that I come from more of a metaphysical background than anything else, and right. and and I can see the creative process at work within him. Now, he wasn't, although he did dabble in looking into spiritual stuff, but he wasn't. You couldn't really say he was a practitioner, but he is a prime example of what a person who is so involved in the creative process and the spirituality that goes with it, that that without even knowing it, he was a a magnet for creative people. He knew how to nurture people. He knew how to turn them loose. He knew how to challenge them. He could gauge a person just by being with them as to whether or not they had the kind of talent he was looking for. And, and, he he made a, he created an atmosphere where my term magic could happen, and there are not a lot of people like that in this world. Yeah, and I, and I think that you can I think you can see some of Jim's, um, you know, spirituality is, is sort of the right word. Mysticism is something I think Jim was very interested. In. I think there's a reason that in the Dark Crystal he calls some of the creatures mystics. In it, uh, you yeah. know, I think Jim was sort of fascinated by that duality of you know of the psyche, and that's that's why in Dark Crystal the primary you know the driving force is you've got these these beings that have essentially been you know split into two th- two halves that are then you know reunited when the crystal is made whole again. Um, I, I think you're seeing some of Jim's you know spiritual um, sort of mystical sensibility at play uh, in that plot line. Or in that storyline, you know, Jim was Jim was you know he was he was raised Christian Science like he was he was around people who who thought about um, you know religion and thought about spirit and thought about prayer um, was not practicing as an adult but uh, you know that had shaped a little bit of his of his worldview as a kid but uh, but I think I, I you know you you put it really lovely which is you know Jim Jim had this ability to sort of see uh, the beautiful in the mundane uh, the beautiful in the simple uh, you know Jim always talked about how Simple is good, uh, and you know, and his his staff Jerry Joel, his head writer, would often say Jim would say simple is good, even as we're all killing ourselves to to make something so simple <laughs> happen. Um, but but you know it, it, that was Jim Jim thought there was beauty in in blades of grass and flowers and nature, and there's a reason he was doing you know, for the environment in the 80s and things like that. I mean Jim really put his you know Jim 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 walked the talk in a lot of these sort of things and and didn't do it overtly. Um, something like Fraggle Rock, for example, is, um, you know, that's, that's the one that Jim actually told his writers, let's do a show that will stop war. And as Mike Britt said, only a cynic, you know, would have laughed at that you know, because Jim absolutely meant it. But that, but that show is about different, you know, species even getting along with each other, realizing they all have to coexist whether they sometimes mean to or not. And that's sort of Jim's worldview as well. Uh-huh. No, he um, and I love the fact that um, he didn't want to be called a puppeteer, and I can understand why because that that was too restrictive. But but what he did with his people, people had to literally try out and try on the different puppets to see what fit them, what they could flow with, um, and and that's 
you know, that, that there's something very magical about that kind of a process. It wasn't just a, can you make good voices and can you read script or can you ad-lib or whatever. It, it had to be, could they create a bond with the character that they were having to emanate? Right, and do, and do all the acting with the end of your arm. Um, yeah. And I, and, I think what, and I think what makes puppetry so um, magical and so special, when, even compared with other creative endeavors, Especially the way Jim does it, the way the Muppet style is performing, and, and let me let me go back just a little bit uh, and explain what I'm talking about here. So when when Jim was coming up into television as a high school student, um, he went uh, down to um, the local television station in Washington D.C. and auditioned to be a puppeteer on a TV show. Jim didn't know anything about puppets. Um, Jim wasn't um, Steven Spielberg crashing his trains into each other at age eight and filming them or anything like that. Jim didn't, you know, Jim watched Kukla, Fran, and Ollie and you know, listened to Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen on the radio, but, but Jim didn't want to really be a puppeteer, but he wanted to be on TV. And when they uh-huh. had the ad in the newspaper for, for puppeteers, Jim went down to the little TV station and said, I'm a puppeteer, and he got hired. Uh, and so then he had to kind of figure it out. So, so what happens because of that? And this is what I love about Jim and, and his work ethic and, and his creative, you know, the way his mind works, is Jim doesn't know the rules of puppetry. So that's one of the reasons why his style of performing became something so innovative. He didn't know what rules he was breaking. And so the big thing Jim does, Jim does two really important things on television. And, again, he's doing this in high school and in his freshman year in college. He has his own TV show on the local NBC station when he's a freshman in college. And he, he develops that – what they it's still the Muppet style of performing to this day, which means um, – Jim understood that if the four sides of the TV are what matters, that's your puppet theater. Um, the way puppetry looked on TV before that was you would film Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. You would film him, you know, you would film um, Bert Hillstrom standing behind the little gauzy curtain and poking the puppets through, and the puppets would talk with, with Fran. Um, but you were still filming the puppet theater. It was essentially a filmed puppet show. Jim's the one who says, I, I don't need that puppet theater because the four sides of the TV screen are my puppet theater. So once you do that, it frees those characters up to move in any direction on that TV screen. They can cut in from the top of the screen if you want, from the side. They can rush the screen. They can back into a shot. It, all of a sudden, it gives that character so much more life. So Jim figures that out sort of inherently. Why would I need the puppet theater? I have the four sides of the TV screen. The other thing Jim figures out, and again, he's still he's a freshman in high school or in college, is if what is on the TV screen is what really matters, then I need to be sure I know what that looks like. So Jim solved that problem by just putting the television monitor on the floor in front of him. So he's watching the performance. So, so it, and it's not even a matter of, you know, making sure your head's not in the shot. For Jim, it was about, you know, making sure the eye lines are perfect and making sure you know exactly where the character is in that frame, watching the performance. But getting to your point about magic is what that does, and no other performer can do this. That's the performer able to watch their performance in real time. No, nobody else can do that. When Pavarotti is standing on the stage singing, he's not watching himself on a camera singing like, like he's sitting in the audience. When you're performing in the Muppet style that way, you're an audience member and you're the creative at the same time. It, it's a really strange and really lovely headspace to be in. And, and what I loved also – was um, he 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 discovered that that he needed to be was it college he measured in in home economics? He, was that high yeah, school? Yeah, he ended up with it was in college. It was in college. He ends up with with the degree in in he ends up graduating from the University of Maryland with a degree in home economics. And the reason he was in home ec is because that's where you know you learn how to do things like you know build theater sets and so and all these things that Jim wanted to do, you know, in television. He actually didn't think he would be a puppeteer. He thought he might work behind the scenes and be a set designer and a set builder. So the only place you could do that was, was in the home economics department. So that's Jim's, Jim's degree is in home ec. Um, and, and he always said it was a great place to be because he said the ratio of women to men was about 300 to 1, <laughs> as he put it. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but that was the one place. And, and one of the courses you had to take or at least was available to you in the home ec department was puppetry. Um, so Jim came into the puppetry class as a freshman. He's walking in with a TV series already. 
um, and his wife, Jane, his widow, when I was talking with her, uh, when I was researching that book, just talked about Jim walking into that class as a freshman and just, you know, being the cock of the walk. Like he was the one who knew how to, he knew how to do puppetry. He knew how to build. He knew how to write. He knew how to perform. She said he kind of took over the class. Uh, and the teacher was just amazed by it. But she said everybody else was just astounded by it because he was so confident um, because he was already doing this and, you know, getting paid to do it. Well, I think he he also he was he was way ahead of everybody else with with how he was able to um, develop new technology to make the puppetry even more lifelike and and the the um, oven mitt with all of the controls in it that that the puppeteer um, was able to utilize to get better expressions out of the face of the puppet and become the puppet more. I mean, the stuff that he developed was just phenomenal. Yeah, Jim was a real gadget freak. Um, he, lo- he loved to play with the tech um, and was always looking for new ways to use technology to make puppets more, like, more lifelike and, and more realistic looking. Um, and one of the first projects um, where he actually starts, starts, to, starts to figure out at least the mechanical side of it is Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas, which is one of my absolute ah. favorite productions. Um, yeah. Around, 19, around 1977. Um, and really all he was using it for at that time was to have Emmett and his mother row a rowboat. Um, so you could have this long-distance shot of Emmett and his mother on an actual river. It was a set that Jim built on a soundstage. Um, and they're in a boat, and they could actually row and steer that boat. And Jim could not keep his hands off of that thing. He loved that tech. And so that's sort of one of the first places you see Jim using that tech to make, you know, more convincing. And, and Jim always liked what he called those how they do that moments. And that's one of those moments when you're watching him in Otter, you're thinking, well, how are, how are they performing those puppets out in the water? I mean, they're, and they really are in the middle of the water, and they're re- remote controlling those puppets. Um, but the real breakthrough comes with, um, with Yoda, because when George Lucas was looking to build, you know, Yoda. At the time, Lucas thought maybe he was going to make Yoda a, a, a monkey in a costume. You know, he didn't quite know how he was going to do this. And finally decided, well, you know, let's, let's make him a, a puppet and decides to work with the best puppeteer and puppet builders on the planet. And so Jim and George Lucas get to know each other, and it becomes sort of this tech transfer because Lucas has all these really great craftsmen who build models and know how to build, you know, what we call animatronics and things like that. And so Yoda is an exercise in making a puppet that has all, as you talked about, has all the little wires remote controls in so he can wiggle his ears and, and his eyes will open wide. And Yoda, when you see him working, is a mess in the sense that he's got these thick cables coming out of him. They're running into the box, and it takes three or four puppeteers to make him work. And, but, but, I mean, the fact that that character is so believable speaks to the power of the performers and, and the way that Yoda's built. So that was another example. That was technology transfer for Jim. And, he, and that, again, he really loved that tech and takes all of everything he learns from that and puts it into the dark crystal then moving forward. So, so Jim was always playing with the tech, advancing the tech, and trying to do something new and different with that technology that somebody had never really thought of before. Well, he also was able to recognize gifts and talents in other people and then give them the atmosphere to develop them and take them as far as they wanted to take them. And I know um, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned the Christmas show with the otters. Um, my favorite song is When the River Meets the Sea. And, oh, yeah. I mean, he he has I mean, he has some absolutely breathtaking um, music that that are are connected to all of his processes. Uh, it's not easy being green. Um, the the um, rainbow connection. I mean, when the river meets the sea, for sure. If, if people don't, haven't even heard that, they should go find it. Um, it's you know, it, there's magic involved in a lot of what he does, and he, it's because he can recognize the magic in other people. I mean, well, he, did David? Yeah, Bo- I mean, he, did, go ahead. Did David Bowie actually write some music too? So David Bowie wrote the songs for Labyrinth, but the um, but the, but the music that you're talking about, things like um, all the all the songs from Emmett Otter. And all the songs from the Muppet movie, Rainbow Connection, that's all Paul Williams and his and his partner, Peter Asher. Is that his name, Peter Asher? That might not be right. Um, 
But th- that's, most, that's, that's Paul Williams. And Jim and Paul Williams had a really good relationship. I mean, if, if you watch Emmett Otter, every song in, in Emmett Otter is a hit. You know, um, uh-huh. every song in the Muppet movie is a hit. I mean, Paul Paul Williams just he he. There's something about working with Paul, Jim and Henson and Paul Williams. They just grew, uh, and and it just it really it's really inspiring for both of them. I think another one that kind of really got Jim, the two of them really got each other was John Denver. Um, you know, Jim uh, does yeah. a number of a number of specials with John Denver, and John Denver's uh, appearance on the Muppet Show is spectacular. Um, I think that's another performer that kind of got Jim, and and he's another one who is very, um, you know, very much, very spiritual in the sense that he's very much about, about nature and the outdoors. And Jim was kind of that way too. Um, so, so I think, I think he and, I think he and John Denver kind of vibed on that as well. But, but, you know, the, the Christmas special, John Denver and the Muppets that they do together just is another one of those just Christmas staples. Uh, another, another, another artist that he and Jim really, really got each other. Um, and then being green is Joe Raposo, who was sort of the lead songwriter on Sesame Street. And Joe Raposo is another of those guys, um, even when he wasn't writing for the Muppets, I mean, the guy could knock out a song about itchiness that, you know, would have you <laughs> have your toes tapping. You would remember forever. Uh, just, to, just, just Jim, brilliant people tended to gravitate toward Jim. Um, and, you know, there was just something about him, him and his, the way he was that people really wanted to bring their best to him. Well, I think he wasn't judgmental, which is what I like. He, he, you know, he encouraged everybody. But like I said before, he was a magnet for creative people, and he created an ap- he he created an atmosphere where they could thrive. And I think what was interesting was that he at one point had a group of people in the United States doing the Sesame stuff. And then he had another group in London doing, um, I, I guess, The Dark Crystal and the Labyrinth. Um, uh, completely, yeah. mm-hmm. di- completely different groups of people. And, you know, there was, there was obviously a little bit of jealousy there. But, <laughs> you know, because cause I, don't, I don't think he thought there was jealousy, but I do believe there probably was jealousy. And um, the stuff that was done in England – you could tell it's a very different different yes. flavor than this stuff that was done in the US. Yes, no that was that was what he called the creature shop work was done over there. Yeah. Uh, and the work and the work in the in the in the workshop in New York was more of the traditional Muppet work. And and uh, and I talk about this in the book and and again this speaks to the power of Jim's personality. Sort of wherever he was felt very loved and very special and wherever he wasn't felt very neglected and very almost resentful that he wasn't there. So, you know, if he, if he was in London, New York was feeling, you know, left out. And if he was in New York, then the people in London were feeling <laughs> that he could, the poor guy <laughs> couldn't win. Um, but, 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 you know, the, the, the other thing you said about him giving people time and, and that's something really special because one of the most important things you can give a creative person is time. And Jim, um, you know, Jim himself, as, even as a young man, uh, was kind of worried that there was never going to be enough time for him. His brother, Paul, who was several years older than him, um, died in an automobile accident uh, at age 19 when Jim was in high school. <clears throat> and I think there was uh, his daughter, Lisa Henson, said something beautiful and tragic to me. She said, you know, I think, he, I think after his brother died, Jim had rocket fuel in his blood from then on. And I think that's probably true. There was, there was something in Jim that worried uh, and unfortunately, rightly, you know, it was a, it was a legit concern that he wasn't going to have enough time to do everything. So the man is constantly in motion, and yet he would always give his performers time to find those characters, take the time to do do the work. Frank Oz always talked about how Jim wanted to do good work, and good work can take time. Um, Dave Gold, who plays Gonzo, for example. He needed time to find Gonzo. He, he couldn't quite figure that character out in the first season of The Muppet Show. He didn't know what Gonzo was about, and Jim kind of you know, gave him the time that he needed. Now, it was also a different era in the sense that also the CBS owned and operated stations and Lord Grey, who, who uh, was letting Jim film The Muppet Show, also told him, take the time you need. Um, you know, if you were doing The Muppet Show today, they'd probably give it one season and take it off the air because they're like, it's not a big enough hit, you take it off the air. Um, Back in 1976, Lord Greg was like, take, take your time. You know, let's, let's get this right. And so the Muppet Show, if you watch that first season, it hasn't found its footing yet. Uh, and it finally uh-huh. hits it by 
probably the middle of the second season. But that you know, that was somebody giving Jim the time that he needed. Well, he didn't have that luxury later on when he was doing the Jim Henson Hour. The network really rushed him. And I think it showed in the in the final quality of the work. But but uh, but getting back to your point, that you know Jim was really good about giving the people the time they needed to be creative, giving them the encouragement uh, that they needed. Now, what sometimes happened is Jim, you know, th- there were a lot of times when his employees uh, would say, you know, he doesn't he doesn't tell me I'm doing a good job, and and Jim could not understand that as a manager. Um, you know, his his producer David Laser would say, Jim, you you've got to hand out the attaboys, and and Jim couldn't understand that. It Jim in Jim's head. If he had hired them, it's because he thought they were great. Um, he didn't know why he needed to constantly reaffirm to everybody they were great. But he does, you know, when you're Jim Henson, maybe you don't understand that the rest of us aren't always like, "I'm doing awesome work." You know, we always we always need that little <laughs> bit of gratification, those pats on the back. Jim didn't quite understand that. Jim was good, knew he was good, didn't need people telling him that. Uh, the rest of us aren't quite that superhuman. Um, so, so his 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 producer David Lynch had to teach him a little bit to go around and tell people they were doing good work. That was probably the one thing that Jim didn't do enough was hand out those attaboys because again his, his view was you're here, I hired you because I think you're amazing, and you know so so that to Jim was enough. Well, he also he had the the such a quality about him. It was really kind of like his word was his bond, and he was very protective of the of the Muppets themselves. And, you know, didn't want to let go of them, even when he was negotiating for the sale of of his company. And and apparently it wasn't until, what, 10 years after his death that Disney actually acquired the Muppets and the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. Well, that, no, they didn't get the kit and caboodle. They would have gotten the kit and caboodle had Jim stayed alive. Um, they ended up just getting the Muppets. Um, Jim was trying to sell them. He, he, he wasn't going to ever give them the Sesame Street Muppets, but he was going to give them the Muppets, the Fraggles, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, you know, Storyteller. Um, he was going to give them everything. And then when he passed, all that Disney ended up getting was the IP that they really wanted, which was, I think, just the Muppets. Now, what uh-huh. was really important to Jim, and you, and you touched on this as well, is, you know, when Jim was negotiating that deal with Disney, um, one of the things he liked about Disney, but one of the things he also wanted to make sure they really kept their word on, was merchandising. Um, you know, Jim didn't want them putting out junk, and that was one of the things that when he was running the show at his company, he wanted he wanted copies, he wanted you know models of everything people were going to try to sell, so he could hold it in his hands and roll it around. And if it was junk, he wouldn't let them do it. Um, you know, so he was because he said, "I don't want a, a little kid who loves Kermit or loves Big Bird to get something that lets them down. That's not fair to the kid, and it's not fair to the character." So he was very protective of them in that in that regard. Um, when he was negotiating with Disney, the other thing he was really, really protective of, and it was very touching to me later on, how a lot of the Muppet performers told me they didn't know this, um, and were really pleased and really happy to know this. So when Jim was negotiating with Disney, it was really important to him to protect those performers. Um, because when he was dealing not so much with with um, Michael Eisner, but mainly with um, with uh, I think Michael Ovitz and I can't think of the other one was, um, but Jeffrey Kastenberg, it was um, you know they were really interested in getting the intellectual property and they wanted the toy box, you know they wanted the puppets, they wanted the Muppets, and Jim was trying to make them understand that without. Dave Gold's doing Gonzo without Frank Oz performing Piggy and and Fozzie, and without uh, you know without uh, without Richard Hunt you know doing Scooter. You don't have the Muppets. You have to take care of those performers. The creative. The reason the reason you think the Muppets are alive is because you have these fantastic performers. So it was really important to Jim to look out for those performers, and he really wanted to be involved in the hiring and the training and the recruiting of performers. That was really, really important to him. And, again, um, it was very touching later on when a lot of performers came up to me later and said, I didn't know, you know, that Jim was, that Jim was really looking out for us. They were really, really touched by that. <clears throat> oh, yeah, really. It was – oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Pollen has gotten to me. <clears throat> I think that that one of the things that that impressed me so much was his desire to preserve the quality. And without those other actors, the quality wasn't there. 
Yeah, and, and you know, and that gets to you. You and I talked earlier in the week a little bit about you know Disney and their handling of the Muppets, and you know, I, I think what you're seeing is is Disney coming to that realization that character is king when it comes to the Muppets. Um, you can come up with a lot of funny situations to put them in, maybe. Um, and that's one of the great games people love to play on Twitter is like, what would be a great movie where, you know, it's all Muppets and you leave one human being? And, like, the, the one that seems to rise to the top all the time is either The Great Gatsby or Murder on the Orient Express. Um, but, um, but, 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 you know, but, but that's the conceit. The character is what really matters. And, and I think, you know, p- people talk about Disney mishandling the Muppets. But I, I think part of it is Disney hasn't figured out the scenario where they work best. But part of that is, you really got to be sure you take care of the characters on those things. And, you know, one of the gripes you would hear about some of those specials that are, you know, the, the puppet series that I made at one point is that the characters weren't, weren't acting the way you wanted them to act. They didn't act like, like the Muppets did. They didn't, Kermit wasn't acting like Kermit. So, so I think they've got to really look out for the characters. They have, they have really great performers. Um, somebody like Bill Beretta, for example, who took over for Rolf and he does, you know, Pepe the Prawn, and he's one, he's one of, he's like Frank Oz in the sense that he's really quick on his feet and he's really funny. Um, you know, you got to let some of these guys cut loose. Uh, and, and I think Disney, I think Disney's getting there. They've had a change in, in they've had a change in management in, in who has oversight of the Muppets now. A woman named Lee, uh, Lee Slaughter, I think. Um, so, so I, I think they're going to, I think the ship is being righted. Um, I never give up on the Muppets. <laughs> um, but, you know, I know there's people think, oh my God, they should give them back to the Hensons. Well, the Hensons, you know, Disney's where the Hensons wanted them. Um, and you know, they're, the Hensons aren't going to take them back. Um, Disney's where Jim wanted them. Disney's where the Hensons wanted them. That's, that's, you know, Jim thought they would take good care of them. Um, it's just now you've got to, well, is- somebody, somebody's got to come in to figure out how you, how you manage that IP in a more creative way. Is Brian Hanston still, connect, still connected with him? So, um, no. Brian and Lisa run the Jim Henson Company out in California. They are not affiliated with Disney. Um, you know, I, I think I think no, no. I think Disney smartly has started to check in with them more and more. I don't know that for a fact, <laughs> but I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they, they're. From what I hear, they're checking with them more and more. You know, I, I really think that Disney learned a lot about acquiring other companies and other intellectual properties um, through the way they handled the initial negotiations with Jim Henson when he was alive. Um, they really kind of blew it. And, and not even Jim dying. I mean, Jim dying, of course, ended the deal. But, 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 the, but the negotiations were not a happy one for Jim. Um, and you know, you remember in the book, he you know he writes this memo to Disney, really tearing them a new one at one point. He never sends it, um, but you know he says, if I'm going to have to justify my you know my worth to you every time I come up with anything, this is not the way I want to work. Um, you know, he was working on Muppet 3D, for example, at that time, and they were they were bickering over his director's fee. And you know, and I I think the fact that that Muppet 3D is still playing at Disney World and Disneyland. <laughs> Speaks to the strength yeah. of Jim as a director, and that is, and his director, she was worth it. But you know, it was, it was not a great experience for Jim. And and I think, um, and and there was there was a lot of talk going on about whether Jim was going to get his own independent production company. I think that was very important to him. Um, but but I think I think the way, how I think in a, in a matter of speaking, how badly they handled that deal informed the way they managed the deals better later on when they acquired Pixar and Marvel and Lucasfilm, you know, you, they kind of figured out you need to leave your uh, a creative in place. You know, they left Kathleen Kennedy there at Lucasfilm and say what you want about Kathleen Kennedy. Star Wars is crushing it. Uh, you know, especially yeah. the TV series on Star Wars are just fantastic. Um, Marvel, you know, you had Kevin Feige sort of like giving everything this continuity to the films and things like that. So I think they learned that you really needed that creative in there. They did the same thing with Pixar, and they had in, you know, John John Lasseter, who was sort of, you know, who had his own problems later. But you know, you had sort of a figurehead who was sort of driving the creative output. And I think I think what they should have done, and they, they didn't figure this out at the time, was you know acquire that company, acquire the Henson Company, leave Jim in intact in there somehow in that deal, or you know, leave or put Frank Oz over the company while Jim's sort of managing his independent production company. Because I think what Jim really wanted to do was play with that production company. That was really important. He would have done something like The Dark Christmas 2, you know, 
something we can't even imagine. Uh-huh. I think I think well, he I was think rubbing he... his hands together, just waiting to get over there to that part of it. I know that he was very in, enthralled with all of the techie stuff that, that Disney had available to him, and uh, kind of wanting to, to stretch his wings. And I mean, for a man that, that wanted to do an inflatable nightclub, <laughs> the nightclub. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> that was that was. I'm glad somebody pulled the plug on that one. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, I mean that was just, like detected, and the tech didn't even exist for that yet. That was one of those where he was so far ahead of the curve. The technology wasn't even there yet to catch up. Had to catch up with him. I mean, what he could do with holographs now would be phenomenal. Yeah, or, or or what would he have done with you know artificial intelligence, or what would he have done with 3D technology, and what would he be doing with CGI now? You know, I mean, Jim. Jim got to dabble with CGI in his lifetime. You know, he loves it so much that he sort of shoots his wad early in Labyrinth. It's in, you know, it's that owl flying over the opening credits, and that's it. Like, he sort of gets it out of the way early. Um, but, you know, he had Waldo uh, in, in the Jim Henson Hour, who was a, a CGI, a schooling computer-generated character. That was all that tech that Jim loved. I do think one of the things that he loved about Disney was not – uh, not just the tech. I think he liked the tech Disney had. He loved the Imagineers. Jim loved working with the Imagineers, first of all, because they never told him no. Um, but, but you know, one of the things that being being involved with Disney is you've got their merchandising and their marketing power at your back. Um, Jim didn't really have that with him. You know, when it came to marketing and, you know, putting his ads on the sides of buses and things like that, Jim couldn't have done that at the Henson Company. They weren't big enough. Um, you know, well, they were like, really successful, my, but they were this very small company. Disney had that had that juggernaut power to like promote stuff and advertise, and that was one of the things Jim really liked about them as well. Well, I know the one place where his jaw just about dropped. He was talking with someone about, well, wasn't it too? He, they were looking at a site for a Muppet ride or something, and he said, you know, "Isn't it too bad that there's then a building or something to get in the way of those wires?" <laughs> <clears throat> and the technician said, "When do you want it?" And, yeah, where, yeah, you know, we, we, yep, exactly. So that so the, it was a matter of, you know, your wish is my command, and and to have access to that kind of a of a support system was phenomenal for him. Um, well, and, and when just, you see the project that Jim had in mind for Disney World, it is heartbreaking. I mean, it is an exercise in what might have been, you know, just these. These really fun rides. Uh, Jim loves the dark rides. Like especially, he especially liked rides if you got to like float in a boat and look at stuff. Um, yeah. But he he wanted to do a ride. He wanted to do a ride, for example, that was kind of a parody of the great movie ride that's there at Disney. It's now what is it now? Disney Hollywood Studios or something. Um, he wanted to do sort of a parody of that where you would see you would get you know scenes from great movies with the Muppets playing the roles like Frankenstein and things like that. And all the information you were going to be getting, as Jim said, was wrong. And he just thought that was hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, you know, he, there's, he, there was just so many things that he wanted to do. And, and we don't even know all of them, but just some of the stuff they even had on paper, it's just, it's just such a shame, uh, you know, that we lost that as well. Just all these really great ideas he had bubbling around. Well, what's, what is the Henson Company doing now then? I mean, they, they don't have the Muppets anymore, so what do they do? Well, they still have The Dark Crystal, um, which, you know, had a sequel on Netflix a couple of years ago. Um, they still own Labyrinth, um, which, you know, is, is constantly, you know, it, it, the Labyrinth just, I think, celebrated its 35th anniversary. Um, they have um, – they do Puppet Up. It's like a live show that Brian does. It's sort of a really wacky and sometimes dirtier side of Muppet performing. Um, they're doing special effects right now for – I think there's, I think the Guillermo del Toro Pinocchio that's coming out, I think has the Jim Henson uh-huh. production doing doing the special effects, doing the creature shop work for that. So, so they they still do a lot of work. They just don't, they just don't, they, they own everything they did before except the Muppets, <laughs> you know. And they still have, um, you know, the Henson Company still um, is under contract, for example, with Sesame Street. They still build the Muppets. Um, when I was doing my research on the book in you know 2009 and 10, and um, I was I was working out of their offices in Long Island, and because that's where their archivist works, and so that's their company. But you know you you would walk in, and sitting on a table would be Grover, and they would be suiting him up for like his Super Grover costume, um, which for somebody you know who was 
two, when Sesame Street debuted, was just, uh, you know, just heaven to, like, see the actual Grover sitting there getting a costume. Um, you know, snuffle up, I guess, is hanging from the ceiling. So, um, so they still do a lot of that work as well for Sesame Street. I think there was something so pure about the, crea- the creation of the original Muff- Muppets. There was an innocence to them, even if they were, even if it was Oscar. You know, there, w- there was something endearing to each and every one of them. And that's where, that's where my, my magic comes in. It was, it was, they were created with love with the intention of giving out a purity that, that was really unique for the time and certainly for this time. And, and it's, there, there's something very special about it. And even Big Bird, when they, when they came out with him, they, at first they wanted him to be dumb and then they decided that he had to just have the intelligence of a five-year-old, which worked. Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, super interesting about the two characters you just talked about is they're performed by the same performer. Um, you know, it's, it's Carol Spinney has got to be probably the healthiest, you know, in, in mentally healthiest person around because he gets to absolutely be both sides of the, you know, the human personality. He can be the crab Oscar and the very innocent big bird. Uh, I don't, I don't think Carol Spinney's ever spent one moment in therapy because he gets to act it out there every day on Sesame street. So, um, you know, two sides of the same coin with him. It's really, really a, a remarkable, a remarkable performance. There's, there's a great picture that you'll see floating around the internet every once in a while of Carol Spinney on his knees performing Oscar while he's wearing Big Bird's feet. Um, you know, which, which is, which, which is, which is really, you know, symbolic. In a way. You know, with the one guy's got both sides. Um, but you know, Oscar was one of those characters. Very funny when um, on Sesame Street, John Stone. Um, Carol, at one point, Carol Spinney, who performs Oscar, talked about Oscar having a heart of gold. And uh, John Stone, who was sort of one of the founders and sort of, the, you know, the godfather of Sesame Street, said that, no, 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 he said that, that Oscar was rotten through and through. <laughs> so that he had no redeeming no. qualities. But he didn't get, you know, but that was his point of view. He didn't get to make that point with Carol Spinney. Carol Spinney didn't see it that way, and he's the performer. And the performer, as we said earlier, character is king. The performer is going to determine that. Um, so even well, if know, John he, he had, Oscar had no redeeming qualities, Carol Spinney was going to give him redeeming qualities. Well, it, uh, I taught special ed for 25 years, and one mm-hmm. Christmas we took several classes down to Radio City Music Hall um, for the production. It was 1776. And, Ooh. you know, the kids were the kids were – this goes way back. Um, the kids were – you know, they were all very good. You know, we – you know, they were – it was they were good kids, and we had I think thirty five kids, and there were four or five of us teachers. And you know that 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 moment after the lights go down before the movie starts, there's that 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 dark pause. Yeah. So in that dark pause, one of the kids suddenly said, "Cookies," <laughs> <laughs> Bro- broke the entire place up. It was you know. <laughs> It was kind of like, okay, so Sesame Street has come to Radio City Musical. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember seeing um, when I saw The Empire Strikes Back in the theater when I was, you know, I think it came out when I was twelve. Um, sitting in the theater, was that the very first time Frank Oz as Yoda said something? You know, a little a little kid in the audience says very loudly, "Grover." Um, ah. Because Oz is essentially, using, he's essentially using the Grover voice for Yoda, and the entire audience laughed because I think all of a sudden everybody went, "Oh my gosh!" Like had that moment of recognition. It really, it really is Grover's voice. Um, it didn't break wow. the illusion, but it was one of those everybody kind of had one of those "Oh my gosh" moments there. That wow, yeah, that that actually is Frank. You know, we we now know that you know somebody's performing Yoda. He's not an actor walking around on a soundstage. Somebody's performing him. Did did you know, Frank, did I, any I, of them actually? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, Frank, Frank, Oz tells, Frank Oz tells a really funny story about how you know the character of Yoda is so convincing because when he was performing Yoda uh, during the Empire Strikes Back, that the that the director of the film, um, you know, they would have to they would cut a hole in the floor that he would stick Yoda up through, and and director would say, uh, Irving Kershner would say. Okay, Yoda, you need to move, you know, four feet to your left. And Oz said all he would do is scream from under the floor because he said, you know, I can't, I can't move any further over. There's a hole in the stage. Um, you know, the illusion was so complete that the director is directing Yoda, not Frank Oz. 
Uh, and that used to happen all the time, even on the Muppet Show. Uh, the directors would sit up in the booth, and they would they would not say, uh, you know, Frank or Jim or Jerry or whoever. They say they say Kermit, Fozzie, uh, <laughs> you know, Rolf. Oh wow! Uh, you need to do this way. And and he said the puppets would turn and respond to him, and not he said it just gets easier to just you know direct the puppet and not the puppeteer. It's, <laughs> again, it's, it's that it's that convincing. Well, it wasn't that one of the problems with some of the movies where they had humans interacting with the Muppets that that uh, they had to make sure that the human would be able to treat the puppet as though they were real, and that in some cases I forget which was it Dark Crystal I forget which movie it was, but the 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 female who had the the female lead wasn't able to um, to relate to convincingly relate to the puppet. Oh, yeah. Some people talked about that with Labyrinth, how Jennifer, um, I can't think of the actress all of a sudden, she's won the Oscar even, who plays, the, who plays Sarah, um, how she couldn't necessarily relate to Hoggle um, because the voice was coming. Hoggle would be in front of her and Brian Henson would be performing the head remotely from off to the side of the stage. Um, even, Dave, even David Bowie talked about how that was a little disorienting until you got used to it. Um, but I think what tends to happen, and, and this is the reason I opened the book with the scene I did. I opened the book with the – it's a famous scene that you can find on YouTube, and it's, it's Kermit singing the ABCs with a little girl named Joey. And it is one of my favorite moments on session. She's, she's the girl who keeps saying Cookie Monster. Uh, instead yeah. of the during the ABCs, and and it's it's one of the funniest, sweetest moments. And there's a moment in where you can almost hear Jim Henson start to start to break. You can almost hear him laugh. But but I started the book with that because what I love about that moment is you know I point out to the reader that Jim Henson is on his knees right in front of her. I mean almost uh-huh. almost touching her. He's on his knees in front of her. Once Kermit goes on his arm and goes up, Jim's gone. Um, and that tends to happen most of the time. Like, watch Jim on Johnny Carson when he puts on Dr. Teeth. Um, uh-huh. The minute he starts performing with Dr. Teeth, he, he's gone. And Johnny starts talking with Dr. Teeth, or he talks with Kermit. You'll see it with um, um, with um, Arsenio Hall when Jim's on his show and he brings out Rolf. Arsenio Hall immediately starts talking with Rolf. That's what happens. Um, and so, so most of the time, if you had a performer that was maybe having difficulty, most of the time when you put that Muppet on, the Muppeteer dropped out. Jim always talked about how a lot of times he would walk in to talk with little kids, and he would just walk in with Kermit or um, with Ernie on his arm and, um, you know, would talk with the kids. And then eventually one of the kids would say to their mom, that was, um, that was Ernie's helper. Like, they, it didn't even occur to them <laughs> that, Jim was, that Jim was performing Ernie. So that's. That's that's how great all those performers are, but that's what tends to happen um, on the Muppet Show anywhere. You you think you're going to be watching the puppeteer? The performance is so convincing that that puppeteer is gone immediately. You're watching just the puppet. You can't not look away from the puppet. No, especially the two old the two old codgers. I love them. Good. <laughs> yeah, that was all the Yeah. Now, wasn't Jim one of those? He was, yeah. It was Jim and Richard Hunt, um, and I always get get them wrong. They're they're actually fitting the order of Waldorf and Statler, and I think Jim is Waldorf uh, in that one. Now, what, so, uh, what's happened to the characters, especially Kermit, that Jim played? I mean, are there actors that were able to come after him? That I think part of what what is magical about it is that there is that not only the aspect of being able to read your lines, but to ad lib and to be as genuine with the ad lib as you are with the, with the, with the uh, <coughs> script that you've got. Well, that's absolutely true. And I, and I think nobody d- did that better ever actually than Frank Oz. Um, if you watch Frank Oz performing Fozzie when they're on like with Michael Parkinson in, Lo- in London or something like that, Oz is, he's so funny. And he's so fast. And Jim is not that fast. Um, you know, you watch Jim trying to ad-lib, and he's not quite, he, he can't even keep up with Oz. Oz is so funny. Um, but after Jim passed, um, Steve Whitmer, who had performed Bean Bunny and, um, like, Wembley, Fraggle, and Fraggle Rock, he took over for Kermit and performed Kermit uh, almost as long as Jim did. I think performed him up until 2018, maybe. 
um, and then retired or was pushed out. There's a number of versions on what happened with that. And since that time, he's been performed by um, Matt. I can't skip his last name all of a sudden. It's so terrible. Um, but, you know, it was another one where they had a lot of people audition for that role. And and so um, so there's there's another performer performing Kermit now. So it's only the third performer on Kermit in, you know, 60 years. Um I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't believe I can't think of his name all of a sudden. He's a super sweet guy. Um, but, you, you know, you've had some performers that have picked up. You know, Bill Barrett has been performing a lot of – has been performing Rolf the Dog since, um, I think, 1996. So and, – and still performs into this day. And Bill Barrett, he's the one I was talking about earlier, is, is one of those guys who's, who's almost as funny as Oz. He also performs um, Pepe the Prawn, if you know who that is. And, uh, and, that, uh-huh. and that character is so funny. And that's one that – you know, he shows up on, on morning shows and just just kills. Um, so Bill Barrett is one of the sort of that generation, you know, second generation of performers who's just super, super funny. Um, the only one left is Dave Gold, who performs Gonzo. And I think Dave still just exclusively performs Gonzo. No, I, I think, no, Dave uh, does um, Statler, I think, today. So this, I think he took over for Richard Hunt. So, so Dave still performs quite a few characters. Dave is 75 or 76 years old now. Uh, he is he is the the man of steel, uh, still doing it, still great at it. That's just a super sweet guy. Um, but he's sort of the last man standing from the original crowd after Jerry Nelson died in 2012 or 13, I think. Wow. I just you know their voices are so unique. You kind of wonder how how does somebody come in and transition? And I guess I guess if you've got the character on your hand <clears throat> that's half the that's half the battle yeah i mean the the voice is important and and this is one that you know i you know muppet fans will disagree amongst themselves and with me on this you know it, it's sort of like people talk about this is the old days this is probably both before both of our times here barbara but you know there was a point when fred flintstone's voice was a little different and barney's voice was a little different i think when mel blank was doing it and they changed barney rubble's voice um and kermit you know when i hear there's there's genera- it's, it's almost a generational thing when you know my daughter who's 25 hears Kermit she hears Steve Whitmire because that was Kermit her entire life Steve I think is great um, but he doesn't sound right to me because I grew up on Jim Kermit <laughs> and uh-huh. Matt now doesn't sound like Steve or Jim but he'll be the Kermit that the next generation kind of grows up with so I think it's one of those like the Kermit you grew up with is the one that sounds right to you. Um, I, you know, Steve, Steve is one, I hear his voice and I can pick it out immediately. I'm like, that's not, that's not, and, and Steve's good. And early on really sounded like Jim and then kind of became his own thing. Um, but the voice is a big part of it. And, uh, you know, again, talking about Bill Beretta doing, doing Rolf, like he's got Rolf down. Um, I think some of them, you know, who have performed the character for a long time, they still sound off me, but again, I'm, I'm Muppets generation 1.0. Um, so <laughs> So, you know, some of those characters have been performed by the same performer for 30 years now, and they still don't sound right to me because it's not Jerry Nelson doing it anymore or Richard Hunt doing it anymore. Well, it's the singing, too. I mean, he had to sing as a frog, for heaven's sakes. Um, yeah, can, can you imagine? I mean, a lot of performers talk about that. You know, they, they would say, you know, Jim would tell them, that's a great voice. Can you sing in it? Uh, because if you can't, you know, then you, you can't use it. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's the hardest part is figuring out not only how your character talks, but then can you sing in that voice? It sounds very simple, and it's super hard to do. <laughs> are they are they still introducing new characters to the Muppets? Yeah, they still do from time to time. Um, I, there's even there's even a brand new one. I think it's a turkey that came out. I, I'm not as up to speed on some of the really new productions, but like when the Jason Segal or the Jason Siegel movie came out in 2011, I think it was. Um, they introduced Walter, a new character in that, who's sort of become, you know, a, a mainstream character. And, um, you know, Pepe the Prawn, who's been – Pepe's been around a while now, but that's the character that Bill Barretta introduced, who's sort of become a, a fan favorite. And then they've even taken characters that were around – you know, when during Jim's time that were on the Muppet Show, like a character like Uncle Deadly, who was sort of their spoof of Phantom of the Opera – Back in the Muppet Show, uh-huh. sort of like a scarier character. Um, that's another Bill Beretta character. Again, a very you know can ad lib like nobody's business. Took that, or is it Matt? Uh, anyway, took that character and turned him into like 
a, a fashion designer. And, you know, like, it, it, just, it was like this very funny, quirky twist on it that just all of a sudden made that character really funny. Um, so, you know, so they're doing new things with old characters, but they also they continue to bring in new characters from time to time. Is there new technology? Matt, Bo- Matt Bogle, that's his name. <laughs> Matt Bogle is the performer on Curbman. Oh, boy, was that going to make me crazy. <laughs> um, now, when Jim left, the technology had gone, you know, amazingly far. Has it gone even further now? Or are they still, Well, you know? I, I mean, it's it's one of those things that like it's 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 a it's a party game almost to play what what would Jim do um, with yeah. the tech, you know I mean like I I asked Michael Frith that question and, and and it's a loaded question and he said Jim would be on cloud nine hundred <laughs> uh, with with you know CGI and and you know just the, the artificial where, where all the tech is now where if you can if you can think of it um, you can probably do it. Now, the Muppets can't be CGI. Like they still got to be the Muppets, but at least you've got you've got a lot more at your disposal now to do a lot of things. And, and you know, for Jim, you have to think beyond the Muppets. You know, what would Jim have done? You know, take a movie like Labyrinth. How would yeah. Jim have made Labyrinth? How would how what would Labyrinth look like if Jim made that now? Um, you know, what would he have done with it? I mean, it's the fact that it was made with old tech and, you know, I mean, there's, there's some, you know, there's some high tech in there. Again, there's CGI in there and things like that. But what, what would he have done with it now if he could create a world that looked like anything? Because you can create it all in the computer now. Um, Lord knows. Well, so that was one of the really interesting things about Jim is like he could take tech that we all use and do something so new and different with it that you're kind of slapping your head going, why didn't I think of that? Well, my thought was, Okay, so he started out with the Muppets, and then, you know, we went Dark Crystal and the Creatures and stuff like that. But would he have walked into a whole new level of technology that is not puppetry, that is not um, the creation of of characters um, physically, but possibly just graphically? Would Would he have gone into... I, I keep I keep hearing holographs, so let's throw holographs in there. It, it's just he was known for the Muppets, but but he was destined. It looked like he was going in other directions because he was really kind of wanting to move beyond what the Muppets and the Dark Crystal and all of that had, and it just it feels like he was going to take a leap next that would have him. Um, you know, there wouldn't be any puppets. It would be a whole other concept that he would be diving into. Yeah, I, I think I would uh, tell, encourage listeners to go. I can't think if they're on YouTube or not. I think they are. Go, go look for episodes of um, the Storyteller, for example, because that was ah, yeah. Jim, that's Jim. Take you know, most of the main characters that they're played by re- real people. Um, and then, you know, you, there, there's one, for example, that's got this beautiful dragon in it that is still being built. <laughs> he, he's not a full, <laughs> not a full on dragon. He's like, he's like a specialist back, but, you know, he's still being built. Um, you know, and that's, that's Jim playing with that tech, but it's a, it's a convincing, it, again, character is king. It's a very convincing, believable character, but interacting with, you know, regular human beings in it. So I think I think go look at something like the storyteller, and I think that gives you an idea of the direction he's going in, um, and that you're sort you're sort of integrating, you know, kind of like in Labyrinth as well. You're integrating the real world or real people with um, puppets, special effects, um, CGI, and Lord knows what else. You know, now nowadays, you know, Jim was fascinated by steady cams. You know, what can you do with a steady cam? He was fascinated by, um, you know, what he loved about um, um, handheld cameras as he said you know it's like, I, he, like, I, I often wonder what he would do with even something as, as dopey as um, the, the you know the ability to make a film on your phone you know uh-huh. what would Jim Henson do with, what would Jim Henson do with TikTok <clears throat> you know what would he do with yeah. it's, it's, you know, he always had this ability to look at something and, and say like wouldn't it be really interesting if you did this and again, we, we would all be standing around slapping our heads going, my God, that seems so obvious. Why didn't we think of that? That was kind of what Jim always was doing with tech. Again, whether it was just taking puppets on TV and going, I don't need the puppet theater. I can just use all four sides of the screen. 
Nowadays, we look at that, and, like, all of us who were raised on Sesame Street and the Muppets, that looks completely normal to us. Jim had to think of that in 1955, and everybody, I'm sure, went, oh, God, that makes that makes perfect sense. Of course you don't need the puppet theater. Well, and he, he got into the, the being able to um, use the eyes and the eyebrows and, and you know, wrinkle the, the forehead and everything. He got into the technology so that – so that they had that literally in their hand and they would be able to touch buttons and make things happen so that the puppets now no longer had just a frozen face, but they had an expressive face. And um, so that he took puppet, because I grew up on Kukla Friend and Ollie as well. I mean, Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember before television existed, and I remember my father bringing the first television home, and the screen was not much bigger than than a, a tablet screen. Say and yourself. you know, <clears throat> yeah. And and so and, 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 you know, and, and not in color. Kukla, yeah. And and yeah, I mean, Kukla Fred and Ollie. I mean, Kukla was about as simple as you got, and Fred, of course, was human, and then Ollie was a dragon. But I remember them, though you know it was, it was fascinating. But but you know again, um, he took it so far, and he probably, you know, was a little further along, but um, not much. You know, when he came in, there was yeah. Captain Kangaroo, and there was Howdy Doody, and but he went to the conventions for the puppeteers only to see what else was going on. And that's when, that's when I think his imagination started to get really triggered. Yeah, and, and you know, and Jim was always really respectful of guys like Burt Hilstrom, who did Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, and, you know, and, and uh-huh. all those who had gone before. And, was, you know, Edgar Bergen was, like, really willing to talk with them and learn from them. And, and you know, and the feeling was mutual because, you know, somebody like Burt Hilstrom, you watch Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, and, you know, you, especially you see the puppets, like, like – uh, Kukla, and you're thinking, God, you know, his mouth doesn't move, and you know how he's. No. My God, you know, there's, and I tell the story in the book. There was a moment on TV when Kukla said he had a cold and he blew his nose on the curtain, and they got inundated in the mail with handkerchiefs from people sending. They're like, please let Kukla blow his nose in our hand. Like, it's it's character is king again. You know, I mean, it's like. The performance yeah. was so convincing that it, you know, again, it's a wooden puppet with a mouth that doesn't move. That's gone. It is, it is now officially Kukla. And, and it's hard to explain, but, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to have a mouth that moves for it to be completely convincing. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things Jim learned from that. You know, it's like that, the, the, the character is king. Um, it, in, imbibing that character with life through the end of your arm is super hard. You know, acting just with the end of, in, end of your arm. And, you know, we always talk about the um, – the choreography of the unseen, like, you know, all the, all, all the, if you ever see Muppet performances below the, the line, there's so much going on. I mean, they're, they're stepping over wires that are running across the floor and they're, you know, they're trying to move around each other and things like that. There's so much going on. Meanwhile, they're acting at the end, with the end of their arm while the rest of their body is trying to stay out of the way of each other half the time. Well, I think also he did say someplace that, that quite often, uh, Kermit could say things that he would never say. Yeah, he always said Kermit was a little snarkier than he was. Um, I, I think the character that's probably closest to Jim's true personality is Rolf. Um, Rolf's a little more homespun. He is less inclined to get to fly off the handle. I mean, that's when that's when Kermit gets really funny. Is when Kermit kind of loses it. That's when Kermit gets really funny. Rolf is not going to fly off the handle. You know, Rolf's a little more homesteaded, like a little homier, wants to tell you the story. That is much more Jim Henson's personality. I think Rolf is much closer to Jim's actual personality than Kermit. But the one thing I love about Kermit is there's a moment when, um, you know, they say something to, to, to Kermit about all the, all the crazies around him, and Kermit's like, well, I'm the one that hired them. You know, like he's the eye of the hurricane, uh, but he's also partly responsible for all the chaos. He's the one that brought all these nuts in, um, and that you know that's well, very Jim as well. I think Jim would be the first to admit I brought all these all these nuts in here. So, well, in the Muppets Take Broadway, there's one place where he turns on everybody and says, "I can't be responsible for all of you," and um, you know, just kind of lays them all flat. And I think in the book, 
in the book he said that that was the first, or in the book he said that was one of the first times that he's ever really blown up, and and he might have felt that in reality too. Oh, oh, oh sure, yeah. I mean, you know, everybody was always looking to was always looking to Jim for all the answers. And that's that's one of the great moments in I can't remember if it's a Muppet Takes Manhattan or the Great Muppet Caper, but it, it is a moment where kind of Kermit turns around and he's like, Why what are you what are you asking me for? You act like I have all the answers. Um and I, I think that was I think that might have been kind of cathartic for Jim. They all kind of look to him for the answers. And Kermit finally gets to lose him and say, What what are you all looking at me for? Um, Jim was expected to always have the answers. And you know, and I and yeah, you know, that's that's a lot of pressure. And I think that's partly one of the reasons that Jim ended up ultimately trying to sell his company to Disney. You know, there's a, there's a moment uh, in the 80s when, um, you know, Brian Henson called it, he said, you know, my, my dad was, there, there was a point where he was kind of chasing the overhead, meaning he was just, he was trying to like keep the lights on. And so he would take on, try a lot of different projects and kind of see what was going to catch fire. Uh, and, uh-huh. you know, there's a story where, where Richard Hunt says something to him about, I I can't remember the rest of it. He's like, you know, what, when are we going to do this? And, and Jim turns to Richard and just says, Richard, I'm trying. <laughs> you know, he's like, he's like we're, you know, I, I, I'm trying. I'm trying on this. You know, there's a, there's a lot going on, and I want everybody to keep working. Like, Jim felt the responsibilities as performers to his staff. He wanted to keep everybody and keep everybody working. But I think that got to be a lot for him. You know, he was in his 50, early 50s at that point. And I think the I think the idea of Disney coming in and taking over that side of the company, taking over that business side of it, in the sense that he wouldn't have to worry about paying rent anymore. He wouldn't have to, you know, he didn't, wouldn't have to worry about payroll. They would all be on Disney's payroll, and he could go and be Jim Henson at that point, and go off and be creative and not worry so much about chasing the overhead and worrying about keeping everybody employed and worried about health insurance and things like that. So. I, so I think that was part of what made the Disney deal very attractive to him um, was just, you know, again, he'd have that independent production company, but he, it, it took that burden off of him um, because everybody really wanted Jim not only to be their boss, but to kind of be their dad, you know, and that's, that's, that's a tough place to be when, you know, you're, um, yeah, I, I, I can't remember who it was who told me, said oftentimes that, you know, Jim was the great relationship in someone's life and, Jim, and Jim's response would have been, oh, I didn't know that. You know, so a lot of people were like, I, Jim and I are great friends, and Jim didn't necessarily know that because they just they all looked to him to be like their parents almost. And that that was a lot of pressure for him. I think, you know, it's, I, have a, I have a friend who has, um, whose mother has dementia, and at one point she asked her mother where she was going, and her mother's reply was, I don't know where I'm going, but when I get there I'll let you know. And that <laughs> right. feels to me, that feels to it's a great title for a book. Um, it, it feels to me that that's where Jim was. He knew he was going somewhere. He didn't know where, and he wasn't sure he could take everybody with him. Right. But yeah, he wanted, both, both to, he wanted to take care of everybody. Yeah, both literally and spiritually. I mean, like when he was working on the Disney negotiations, there was a time when Disney came in and said, you have too many employees. You can't take everybody with you. And they had to, you know, let go um, their housekeeper, who they all loved. Um, they had to let her go, you know, and that just broke Jim's heart. Um, so, you know, he was trying to take as many people with him. But on the spiritual side of things, I mean, think about that really beautiful series of letters that Jim wrote to his family to be read in the event oh, yeah. of death, which he didn't know was coming. But, you know, he, he writes these in 1985, you know, 1986, right after Labyrinth or right before Labyrinth comes out. Um, and they're very, um, I mean, this is a funny word to use, but they're, they're very grown up. You know, it's a very healthy thing he's doing. He sits down and he says, I'm, I'm sitting here in my hotel in Paris, and it's absolutely beautiful out, uh, which means it is time for me to talk about death. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> just an absolute healthy outlook. On things. Let, let me talk to you about death. You know, here's what I want you to do when I die. And please don't feel bad because, you know, I'm going to be watching over you wherever I am and I'll help you out if I can. And if I can't, I'll see you when you get here. I mean, gorgeous. Very healthy, completely gorgeous. And I think after Jim passed and they read those letters at his funeral or his memorial service, I think that was one of the things where everybody in the audience almost did this collective gasp thinking, 
God, you know, he's right. You know, he's right. <laughs> and as Jim says, yeah, I'm right because who's going to argue with me because I'm dead. <laughs> but but yeah. you know, this very this very healthy um, mental and spiritual outlook. Well, you know, it, I think also one of the, the the things that came out so clearly in your book is that he was a fabulous, fabulous father. Maybe not such a yeah. great husband, but a great father. <laughs> Correct. And and you know, and his parent and his his parents, his kids all said too. One of the absolute best ways to be with him was to work with him. Um, and you know, his, Cheryl, for example, would take every summer during the school year, take summer off, and she'd go to London and go work in the Muppet shop during the Muppet Show. And Brian would do mm-hmm. the same thing. It's a, you know, they they all loved working because Jim loved to work. Um, but, you, you know, the kids all to a person just talked about what a sheer joy it was to be with him when he was working. And, you know, and Jim wasn't one of these parents who, when the kids were around, would ignore them or say, you're in the way or don't bother me. Um, everybody talked about how if one of his kids came over to talk to him, he would stop everything he was doing and and, and listen to them right at their level, um, which I think uh-huh. is one of the reasons Jim was so, was so great at doing what he did on Sesame Street. Jim had that ability to stop everything, listen to kids right at their level, um, you know, never talk down to them. Um, and everybody talked about how Jim always did that with his own kids, and I think that, I think that translates right to the screen in something like Sesame Street. Jim has never condescending to kids in Sesame Street. Well, if, if parents want to have a good lesson as to what to do with your kids, there was always something creative going on there. They were always, they had projects all over the place. They were creating and having fun together, creating. And, and um, but he was incapable of relaxing, I think, for any length of time. Just, yeah, and even his, his, and even his va- even his vacations. I love that his daughter Heather talked about how even his vacations. The term she used was totally over the top. Um, you know, she talked about how he, he's going on vacation. He say, "Okay, we're all going to go hot air ballooning over the Alps." <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and off they would go, or they'd go on ski trips to you know to Vermont, and then later on to Switzerland. You know, and it was always great fun. And they were always, as she always said, they were these completely over the top vacations. Like Jim did everything big. Well, and he would he would play for a couple of days, but then his head got in the way, and he was he was working. Um, yep, yeah, he, he was, I, you know he he'd, he'd leave the family on the ski slope, and he'd fly back to Los Angeles. That's absolutely right. But it, it just I, it the fact that he was so good with his children, not only that, but he was great with his wife too. I mean, he was considerate of her. They never did divorce, I don't think, did they? They never did. They were – Jane Henson had the greatest phrase for it. She called it a handshake of a separation. Um, I, I think had Jim lived, they would have ultimately gotten divorced. Um, and what the archivist and a couple of people told me, they said it was actually the fact that they were, you know, having the conversation about dividing assets and things. They said it actually really helped them as a company because they had to figure out what they had. <laughs> so uh-huh. you know they were doing head counts on how many puppets do they have and what you know so they they really he said it actually really helped in the inventory things in that regard but you know Cheryl talks a lot about the relationship with the parents you know how how both of, how they got along and and even when they were fighting and in the throes of you know arguments Jim always would go back to Jane and say you know did you watch my appearance on Johnny Carson the other night what did you think um, you know uh-huh. she she for her she for her entire life was his best audience, meaning not only did she always appreciate him, but she, she was the one who could say, you know, you, you did great. Um, you, you came in early on the punchline on this one, or, um, you know, you, you missed a beat here. Like she, she could be absolutely honest with him in a way that didn't remove, like, like didn't crush him. Um, she, so she was, she was the one person whose opinion he absolutely valued. And, you know, and again, they had a lot of history, you know. I mean, they'd been dating or with each other. They didn't start. They weren't dating at the time. But Jim had known her since he was a freshman in in college, and she was a senior. She was four years older than he was. Um, you know, it was the one. It was one relationship that was hugely important to him. And so, even as even as they're not always agreeing, they were constantly coming back together. And and you know, and Jane even talked about how they always came back together when it involved the kids as well. Um, but you know, Jane 
is, is the one who, after Jim passed, um, helped establish the Jim Henson legacy. You know, so, so Jane really, really loved and understood and got Jim, like really understood, understood, um, you know, what he was doing was innovative and important and forward thinking. And so, like, she, she's the one that really helped keep that reputation alive. Uh, really helps keep that creative energy alive. You know, the, there's the Jim Henson Foundation still to this day that gives out awards for innovations in puppetry. Um, you know, they gave an award years and years and years ago to Julie Tamor, who then ended up doing The Lion King on Broadway with all those big puppets. So, like, they're really great at identifying and nurturing talent. So, and, that, and that was one of Jane's real superpowers, and that was one of the things Jim really relied on her for. She was his recruiter, man. I mean, she would go out and watch local performers come back to him and say, there's a kid down in Atlanta uh, working, I think, for Sid and Marty Croft. You need to go down and talk to this kid. He's great. And that was Steve Whitmer. I mean, she was really, really great at scouting the talent. Well, she was also his best friend. Oh, ab- that ab- absolutely, a- absolutely. Which sounds, con- you know, which sounds strange to people when you're when you know you realize they were divorcing, closest confidant and uh, one of his best friends. You know, and as, as I think Cheryl put it. He said, you know, his, the, the issue that they had was he didn't he, – he couldn't make her happy. You know, he, he wanted to, but he just was, he, he couldn't do it. But that didn't mean they couldn't be great friends and that they, you know, that they, that they couldn't raise their kids together still and that she hadn't helped him build a company for crying out loud. So, you know, they, again, they just had so much history together. Well, she was there when he passed away too. I mean, yeah, isn't that I think, was it? Yeah. That's that's the person he called. Uh huh. And and so she was, you know, there was there's I, I, a, a special relationship for sure. I I think when you've got somebody like him that is so full of that creative energy that he just couldn't sit still. I don't think that he was capable of of you know sitting back and just I don't know watching the river flow by. You know it was something would inspire him and he would be off and running or there would be a thought for a song or a character or or another spin on something that he was doing there was always his brain never stopped i and the one yes. thing that i i i noticed and, and i i wasn't sure but i was going to ask it it feels as though he had the kind of energy that he did not sleep much at night yeah, no, he no, he clearly did not. Um, and, you know, and there's a really, I think it's a story that Carol Spinney tells about being with Jim and at some event until you know after one o'clock in the morning or something. And uh, and Carol says something like, "I need to go and go to bed." And Jim says, "Well, you know, I have to be up for a six a.m. meeting anyway." And you know, he just he just didn't sleep all that much. It was just go 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 with him. Um, you know, and again, I, it gets back to that whole. That whole that whole matter of time, you know, did Jim know somehow that he was not going to have enough time? And so he is just he is constantly in motion, constantly pitching. I mean, when you go through his archives and you go through the projects he's working on in the '60s, which is one of my favorite times in his career because it's so diverse, uh, so interesting, so many projects he's doing, a lot of which don't even feature the Muppets, and. He's just, he's constantly writing ideas down, and you know, and and if he has an idea for one of the things he wanted to do was a Broadway show, <clears throat> and again, this is years before things like The Lion King. He wanted to do a Broadway show where the performers are standing out on stage, but you know, they're and they're performing their puppets like we see on Avenue Q, for example. Um, but he he wasn't just writing down this idea for them; he was writing song lyrics, you know, for for songs these performers might sing. Like he was really, it was really, really thorough. Um, so he wasn't doing anything half-assed. I mean, everything was very well thought out, even if it went nowhere. Um, you know, he was working with Marshall Brickman. You know, Marshall Brickman, who ended up writing, you know, Jersey Boys much later on, things like that, and wrote, uh-huh. I think, for Woody Allen, things like that. So he had really good collaborators, and some of these projects didn't go anywhere. But just the 60s is exhausting because, you know, he's got the idea for the nightclub, for the Cyclean nightclub, and he's doing experimental films <laughs> like Time Peaks, and he's, and he's doing documentaries like Youth 68. And, I mean, he's just he's doing so many different things, and also the Muppets, by the way. Um, but he's just he's doing so many different things. I, I think that period in his life is just so fascinating because he doesn't know at that point how it's going to turn out. 
He's doing a lot of different things. Is he going to be an experimental filmmaker? Um, you know, he does Timepiece, that seven-minute film, nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, is he going to be a documentary? Uh-huh. You know, he does U68. Um, he does The Cube, like that kind of Twilight zone one-hour special for NBC. Is he going to do experimental films like that? He's just got so many things going on that, you like, he could have gone at any point in any direction. And what ultimately happens is Sesame Street comes along and kind of defines his course at that point. But I just I find the 60s so interesting for that reason because just so much paper was going on at that time. So many ideas. It's just so fascinating and exhausting almost even just to read through. When did uh, the the uh, uh, the Saturday Night Live stuff come in? Was that that same period of time? Saturday Night Live uh, comes along in 1975. And that and that comes along at the point when Jim is trying to get his own series for the Muppets. He's he's pitching the Muppet Show at that point. Now the Muppet Show is one of those another one of those projects from the nineteen sixties that had been in his notebook since, you know, nineteen sixty five, sixty six. Um, that he was that he was pitching and couldn't get any takers. And then the early seventies he uh talked with um Michael Eisner, who's at A B C at that point. And Michael Eisner says, well, I'll, you know, I'll let you do – they didn't really call it a pilot, but he does one of his first specials. It's the Muppet Valentine special, and that's uh-huh. sort of a dry run for the Muppet show. Um, doesn't really do – I mean, it's well-received, but doesn't, doesn't get him his own TV show. Um, then a couple of years later, he does Muppet show Sex and Violence, which he thinks is hilarious because Muppets were anything but sex and violence, so he thought that was very funny. Um, and you're starting to see characters at that point come in, like Dr. Teeth and Animal are in that one. It's still, you know, his problem at that point is he, in neither one of those specials, can, Kermit is not the host, and he can't figure out where it's set. Like, the first one's sort of this vague, like, conservatory, and the second one is maybe in the backstage at a TV station. Um, you know, he, he finally catches lightning in a bottle with the Muppet Show when he's got them backstage at the theater. You know, there's something about that that feels very familiar. Um, but but the first two specials don't really do anything, um, and then he's offered Saturday Night Live. At the time, he's still trying to get the Muppet Show. So SNL comes along, and when Lauren Michaels was putting that show together, I mean, Jim is such a staple in television. That's what we forget. I mean, Jim is doing variety shows constantly. He's on the Share Show, and he's you know he's he's he's, just, he's doing everything. He's on Ed Sullivan all the time, and he's on you know <laughs> I can't, I, if, if there was a variety show of the era, he's on it. And um, so when they're putting together Saturday Night Live in 74, 75, they, there were three things that, that were sort of Lorne Michaels must have. One of them was um, filmed by Albert Brooks. Uh, I forgot the second one all of a sudden. But the other, but the other element was, was Jim Henson. Um, you know, they said you have to have Jim Henson in this. So, so Jim was one of their must haves to move forward with SNL. And so he's in the first season. Um, wasn't a great fit was the big problem there, partly because Jim's crew did not get to write those installments. Um, due to, like, union regulations, things like that, they're, you know, they're, the Muppet writers couldn't write the Muppet sketches. It was Jim's concept. He wanted to try something new, and that's why the Muppets on SNL looked very different from Muppets at that point. That they, they sort of looked like what was going to come later. You know, they almost looked like Dark Crystal-type characters almost. Um, but the uh-huh. writing on it is a real. But the writing was a real problem on it. It was not a great fit for them. Well, he just you know he 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 was all over the place, and it it really when when you see that his career span in television spanned such a great length of time, I mean it's it's amazing. He was definitely one of the innovators for for entertainment for sure. And I love the fact that that he was he was moving into new directions when he sadly passed away, and I think he did have enough time to do all he was here to do. I, I think that at, at that particular time frame, there was nowhere else to go. But given another decade, um, the sky would have been the limit. So, um, you know, none of us die before our time. It just feels like it sometimes. Yeah, that was that was one of the things that Richard Hunt said during Jim's memorial service was he has this great line where he says, you know, we all we all have jobs. And Jim had done his 
And that was sort of Richard's approach to things. Is Jim had, had done the job that he was sent here to do. And, <laughs> and again, another really lovely sort of healthy approach to life and death with that. And uh, what's actually really heartbreaking with that is Richard, even at that time, um, I believe already knew that he had AIDS. And Richard, I think, died two years later, um, right after that. So, um, so he got to talk about Jim, you know, being there on this earth a short time to do the job he was there to do. And you could probably say the same thing about Richard. Well, it, it's just that, I, I mean, it's still going on. I mean, you know, what he started is it still has a life of its own for sure. And and it just, it feels to me as though he provided the atmosphere for so many people to find their their creative center and do something with it. I mean, have how many people have gone from being a part of his process into certainly certainly Yoda in Star Wars? I mean, that's notoriety for sure. Um, oh, for sure. I mean, how many people have really taken what they and they used it as a stepping stone to go further? Directorially, well, I think they have. Well, somebody like Frank Oz, for example. I mean, you know, Jim Jim very graciously and generously brought Frank Oz in to co-direct Dark Crystal with him, and Oz went on to have a huge, you know, huge directorial career, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and, you know, Death at a Funeral, and, I mean, just so many great movies and, you know, great specials and things that he just did that in and of itself on Hulu, for example, which was just lovely. Um, but, um, you know, it's... It, What's so fascinating to me about Jim and, and a lot of those, you know, we talk about some of the places where he was going um, when, when, he, when he passed, you know, something like the Dark Crystal. When Jim's out promoting the Dark Crystal, the poor guy, the entire time, the first question he gets most of the time is, where are the Muppets? And he has to explain <laughs> to them, he's very, and he's very patient with them, he has to explain in almost every interview that the Muppets aren't in this, and he would laugh about it, the Muppets aren't in this, and you know, and he was trying to explain. I'm, do, I'm doing something different, you know. And and I'll admit, I and I told Lisa Henson, I said I was part of your problem. You know, I was 12 or 13 when Dark Crystal came out, and I kind of walked out of there going, "Where were the Muppets?" You know, Jim was trying to grow up, and we weren't going to let him. You know, because we thought somehow that meant we couldn't have the Muppets. And Jim and Jim's attitude is, "What was? Why not both?" You know, I can give you the Muppets, but I also want to go do these things. Um, and on a lot of those projects, especially the, the one that I really point out uh, that I talk about a lot in this regard is something like Labyrinth. Labyrinth is one of uh-huh. those that that um, was – Jim was right about Labyrinth, but at the wrong time. When I present on Jim Henson and I'm doing my talk on him and I have slides that I go through and I show clips and things, when I put the slide of Labyrinth up on the wall, the place goes crazy. That's one of those things that I, I wish he knew the response that gets now. Because, because as, as I said, he was right about Labyrinth. But when he released it, no, nobody got it. And that's another one where, you know, Lisa had been, it was very funny. She said to me when I, one of the first times I talked to her, um, did you see Labyrinth in the theater? And I said, actually, you know, I did. I said I was a freshman in college and I went on a date with somebody who saw Labyrinth. And she says, kind of funny, she goes, oh, so that was you then. You know, I mean, they, <laughs> they, even they knew that, like, Labyrinth didn't have the audience in 1986, that it does now. Um, like I said, that, it, that movie, it, it, it's huge. As movie theaters, especially, like, within the last year, it was its 35th anniversary. The local theater here in Albuquerque showed it for two, you know, two weekends in a row, like, packed house every time. People adore that movie. I wish Jim had gotten to see the recognition, the love that people have for that movie, because it was really important to him. Um, that movie looks a lot like his kind of artistic sensibility. That's, I mean, that, that, that's his vision. It's like very elegant and, you know, futuristic and, and, and noble and old looking and Victorian looking. I mean, you know, it's, all, it's, it's sort of everything stirred up and that's very much his artistic sensibility. I just wish that he, I hope wherever he is, he knows how much people love that movie now. That was so important to him. Well, I'm, I'm sure he did and does. I think that that he there was such, you know, I, I, I see such depth in everything that he he did. Such um, such a, a crea- you know creative genius, absolutely. And I find it fascinating that you have written 
you know, you've written a book on, on Jim Henson. You've written a book on um, Washington Irving, um, Dr. Seuss, and, oh, gosh, there's the other one. Um, George, Jim Lucas. George Lucas. George Lucas, you've you've cued in on people that that have an exceptional talent and ability to tune into the creative flow inside of themselves and use it within their physical reality. And um, right, yes, yeah. that's 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 a talent and a gift within itself. Yeah, I, I would tell everybody I, I, with my books, I own your childhood for the most part. Um, wh- I mean, and, and, what, and what, we'll put Irving aside for the moment, although this is true of him, um, you know, especially what, what Lucas, Henson, and Seuss all kind of have in common is, you know, they were sort of breaking all the rules in their chosen genre, their chosen field, their chosen format, television, film, children's books. Irving was even doing it with, you know, books in the 19th century. Um you know, Lucas is one of these guys who, when he's making Star Wars, for example, n- nobody at that time, nobody had special effects. Everybody had closed down their special effects shop, and Lucas, Lucas's attitude is, okay, well, I'll just I'll do it myself. And he creates Industrial Light and Magic, which is still kind of the gold standard of special effects. And, uh-huh. you know, he says, my movies, why do my movies sound amazing in my, my home studio here at, at Lucasfilm, and they sound awful in the theater? And somebody said, well, because we have our studios wired differently and the speakers are here and here and the acoustics are that we broadcast them. and Lucas said well I want all movies I want movies to sound great when they're out in the movie theaters why can't we do that so that's where THX sound comes from so Lucas is like it's constantly reinventing film you know I mean it's like it, it's already it's already huge enough that he's sort of created modern folklore and pop culture through Star Wars and Indiana Jones and I think but even apart from that he's the one who's, who's inventing Digital filmmaking, you know, THX, ILM, tools that he was creating because they didn't, they didn't exist. You know, he said, I want to be able to, um, while I'm editing a movie, I don't like the color of the curtain in the background. I would love to be able to change the curtain from blue to red. And in digital uh-huh. editing, you can now do that. Jim Henson would have loved that, you know, the ability for absolute control by the creative. And that was, that was one of Lucas's driving factors, was the creative to be in charge. The suit should have no say in these things. Uh, and Jim Henson was sort of that way, too. You know, let me, let, put me, let me stay in charge of my creations. That's why those Disney negotiations kind of went off the rails at times, because, like I said, the lesson I think they learned was you leave that creative in place when you take over the company or you absorb the company, because you need that creative force in there doing that. Seuss is like that as well. Seuss was the one who kept telling um, you know, kept telling book buyers and librarians, you guys can't write off young readers. They will be the readers of the future, but you have to stop giving them terrible books. You know, you can't yeah. give them Dick and Jean and their lives of quiet desperation. Nobody wants to read that. You need to give them something no. fun. Um, and Sue steps forward and does that. And, and even more importantly, what Sue does is they, they come to him and they're like, this is the list of you know, 385 words that teachers have approved for reading primers. Can you use these? And he goes away and comes back two years later with the cat in the hat that uses words that are educator approved. And that's what makes Sue so important. But nobody had done that before. You know, that, that gets to me talking about finding solutions hidden in plain sight. This is the one who says, great, let's take, the, let's take the approved word list and make it fun to read for crying out loud enough with Dick and Jane. Um, so that's what I love about that sort of the through line that runs through the subjects I've written about is, is they're out, they're out there breaking the rules on these things because, you know, it, it, they find it creatively stifling, but also they all want their work to matter. Um, you know, they want people that they, Seuss often said, or, or Irving often said at one point, um, I don't write for posterity. You know, I, I, I want readers to read and that should be enough. And it, I mean, what a what a great mission, you know. And Seuss was kind of the way. He's like, look, I'm writing for kids and adults. The hell with them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> actually yeah. The hell with them, um, you know. So so they're all sending, doing what they set out to do. Lucas is inventing the tools he needs to do what he needs to do. Jim is the one who's trying to run the table, constantly working, but also saying I'm controlling the merchandising here. Tells his agent, don't sell my copy, don't sell my property, don't give Rolf to Purina Rolf, and I want to own Rolf. How dare you sell Rolf? Um, you know, they, they built, they invest in themselves constantly. 
which I think is something we can all learn. And especially creatives need to, like, learn. This is one of the things that's great about Lucas and great about Jim Henson. These guys all knew their work had value. And that's, that's one of the things I hope creative people take away from reading about Jim Henson's life is value your work. You know, your work has value. Your work is important. Your art is important. Um, value that art. Don't let anyone take that art away from you. Um, I think nowadays more than ever, we really need creatives understanding their art can make a difference. Own it. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because when you were talking about Lucas, I grew up on Flash Gordon, Buster Crab, and the spaceship uh-huh. hanging by a string. I mean, you yep. could see the string the spaceship was hanging on. Yeah, um, so did he. And, he, and he loved it. Oh, really? Yeah, Lucas loved wow. it. Wow. Lucas, Lucas was trying to make Flash Gordon. He couldn't get the rights to it. Um, and when they, when when they when I, I think it was King Feature said no, you can't have Flash Gordon. We're actually holding that. We want <laughs> we want somebody else. We want Federico Fellini to take that, which he didn't. But um, so Lucas w- went went away and said, okay, well, I'm going to make my own version of Flash Gordon. I'm going to do a movie that embraces all the things I love about Flash Gordon. Uh, and you know, thank God he didn't get Flash Gordon. We wouldn't have Star Wars. But Lucas loved those Flash Gordon serials. Um, you know how how they would end on cliffhangers. That kind of informed the way he did Raiders of the Lost Ark. People always forget, like, he created Indiana Jones. Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark was, was his love letter to those Flash Gordon serials in a way. Uh, or, there was one that was about somebody who was like a Navy genius, like a Navy spy that was, he's sort of getting. But, you know, every, every episode ended on a cliffhanger. Lucas wanted a lot of, I think if you actually count them in Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think there's 12 cliffhangers in that movie. Um, so that was sort of his salute to those old Saturday morning serials. Like Lucas takes everything that he loved and mixes it around and does something else with it. But he would be with you. Well, he loves a, Flash Gordon sits on a string. Okay. Well, there's an app, and I won't name the app, but um, there is an app that, that you can get on the phone that tells you when you can get up and go to the go to the restroom and he tells you what's <laughs> happening in that in that in that that time frame where you know where uh-huh. you're gone so that when you come back into the theater you're all caught up and in <laughs> most of Lucas's films um the app says forget it there's no place to take a break <laughs> I would believe it I would believe it I remember even even uh, having seen Star Wars seven seven times as a kid I, the only time I would ever go to the bathroom was during the dog fight when they escaped the Death Star, and even that is way too exciting. But that was the one point where I'm like, okay, well, I know they're just going to fight this ship. But, yeah, it's really his, – his are hard. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, come on. There's got to be – you know, you, you get you get <laughs> done with with one – and what was the – the only other one that, um, that, that, that I found that, that didn't have was Deadpool, the first one. There was just oh, no yeah. no place for a break. <laughs> I don't doubt that either. Um, but but you know it's it's so so you you're you seem to be very keyed in and attra- and and attracted to these kind of energies. So that must be the, uh, I would hazard a guess that you have the same kind of energy that that you're constantly looking for the next project, the next step, the next place to take your energy. Well, I think what I like more than anything is I like knowing how stuff works. Um, I was the kid, for example, who, you know, even back in the days when we had DVDs, which we don't do that much anymore, I would watch every making of feature, every behind-the-scenes feature, every director commentary. I wanted to know what was the creative process that went into this. I'm fascinated by the creative process. I'm fascinated by fly on the wall conversations. I'm a huge Beatles fan, and I love oh. the Peter Jackson documentary that came out on Disney. The three, you know, the, the eight hour um, get back one because you're you're a fly on the wall watching. They, they actually have that wonderful moment when you actually get to see Paul McCartney right get back, like the camera's right there as he as he starts banging it around on the bass and comes up with it. I I love the creative process. And so I think that's one of the things that really attracted me to those, to, to actually everybody that I've done. You know, what, 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 what's it like to be, you know, at WRC TV studios with Jim Henson in, in high school and in college doing your own TV show? What's it like when you're trying to sit down and write the Dark Crystal with your daughter because you're, 
you're stranded at the airport because there's a massive snowstorm. You know, what's, what's that like? What's it, you know, what's it like when you're George Lucas and you're in film school and they're trying to tell you that you can't use sound in your student film. So I, I love, I love the creative process. And uh, that's why I would love to write about a musician. I haven't found a musician to write about yet because I haven't done a musician yet. Um, and, and I, I, you know, looked into writing about a comedian because I haven't done a comedian. I, so I, I love creative people and I love the creative process. And I, I just love knowing how that works and how people think and taking stuff apart and, you know, putting it back together again and watching how the final product comes about. I just, I'm just so fascinated by that. Yeah, I just recently did a book on George Henson. Um, what is it? Um, oh, gosh. I can't remember the title of the book, and I just did it. Uh, George Harrison, <laughs> and and oh, it was uh-huh. um, it was here comes the light, here comes the sun, and it okay. was it was really good on learning what his life was like and how it it it, it did a similar process as you've done. You just go right from the very beginning all the way through to the end, and it's it's just it's these people that have this their juices flowing almost before they're born. And part of it is curiosity. Part of it is, is a creative process. And another part of it is that they are in situations that support their creativity. They found a, a channel in which to express themselves creatively, and therefore this just flows and it changes their life forever. And, you know, I, I would say that that you know you'll probably find a lot of you know, you'll find your comedian and your and your and, and your um, musician I'm sure um, because there's there's a creative process and it's the creativity it's the it's the link to the spirit within that opens that portal to creation that allows you to constantly be drawing that energy into your life and and you have then the channel to manifest it through. And when you're manifesting it, magic happens. And um, in music, it happens. In 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 art, it happens. Uh, there there are just people that just ooze this kind of energy that is so profound that you want to you want to get close to it and hope that some of it rubs off on you. It's that well, magical. Well, that's, you know, that's that's one of the things that I actually really love about biography. Um, and and that's why. You know, and I'm a, I'm one of those biographers who I, I have to be careful in a way about who I choose as my subject because I can't compartmentalize. Um, I have a colleague, for example, who wrote just this, this wonderful book about Nixon. And I, I couldn't write about Nixon um, because I can't live in that world uh, constantly for, you know, the three or five years that it takes to do a book. I kind of need a, you know, a – whatever you think about Nixon, but I, I kind of need a, a decent human being, <laughs> you know, because I, <laughs> I, you know, and I've been very, I've been very, I've been very fortunate in my subject that, but you know, they're, they're all, they all have their own flaws, um, you know, and, and one of those weird through lines that runs between at least Lucas Henson and, and Dr. Seuss is they all, you know, they all had women who they adored and worshiped and were hugely important in both their creative and professional lives and who they all lost through either benign or intentional neglect. You know, there's like that through uh-huh. line through there on that. Um, but uh, people, and that's one of the things for me that's really magical about biography is, is you get to you get to live this person's life uh, vicariously oh, yeah. in a way. And and so and so again, that's why I have to be very careful about who I pick because again, I can't compartmentalize. I have I have great writer friends who can do that. I'm not able to do it. Um, so, so that that to me is part of the magic of biography, and I love, you know, I often, I often have people ask me like, what's your favorite thing that you when you were in the archives, you know, what was the, your favorite item or your favorite piece of paper, or whatever, and the the thing that I loved the most in the archives, and it didn't, it doesn't even get mentioned in the book because it was just it was just a thing. When they were filming the Muppet Show. In London, when the script came out every week, Jim would take his script, and he had this beautiful leather folder with his name embossed on it. I think it had the Muppet Show logo on it. And he would slide the script into it every week and carry that around with him every week with the script in it. I held that 
leather binder in my hand. Oh. That, to me, was one of the most useful and incredible experiences, as valuable to me as a biographer as reading his diary. Um, just because it's, it's, a, it's an object that your subject touched, that they held. Um, you know, if, if you want to get deep about it, you know, the, 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 part of their essence is contained within that object. Um, and Absolutely. that's why I love when you find things that when I find things that, you know, and Jim did a lot of stuff that he wrote out long, you know, just in longhand, black pen on yellow paper. And you love seeing your subject's handwriting because it gives you, a, it gives you an insight into their state of mind. You know, if they cross things out, you know, things that we don't do nowadays. I, I actually, I, I, I'm worried for biography in 50 years because we don't leave paper records around anymore. We delete all our emails. That's our correspondence these days. Um, whereas back then they wrote letters. So I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow's biographers do for that, but but that object holding that leather binder um, was one of the neatest experiences of my life. Just just knowing Jim himself walked around with that in his hands for five years. There was something really, really special. I think that's I think that's the favorite thing that I touched in those archives. I would have thought too. Anything that he put um, his own personal doodle on or you know, scribbled here or scribbled there so that, you know, you could see that he had, you know, there, there was there was a part of him that, that had to go on top of whatever the prepared script was. <laughs> you um, know, it's funny, too. I, I could pick his doodles. Out. If you would put 100 pages of, of, you know, meeting notes in front of me, I could pick out his in a second. Um, his doodles all, there's there's a certain look to all of his doodles. Um, that I that I could I can't describe it, but I could I could pick it out of a hundred different pieces of paper, um, seeing it. Well, I, I, there's magic in in just about everything he touched, and he was so fortunate because he was in a position to be able to um, to realize all of the things he was visualizing to that point in time. Now, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, it would have continued on, but. But it seems to me that that uh, he had the flexibility to to utilize that creativity and and to you know to to follow through with it and, and to graduate with a home ec degree. Um, yeah, I know. You know when uh, when I was in school, I did mechanical drawing because that's where all the boys were, and um, <laughs> and and actually. I didn't score with any of the boys, but what I learned in that helped me to create a whole deck of cards. And it was the training that I got in high school in mechanical drawing that helped me to wow. draw the 52 cards that became the deck of cards. So, oh, wow. you know, it was it, it was kind of like, look at this. I, you know, I have to say that in for all of the for all of the schooling, quote unquote, that I have and I've got two master's degrees. Um, the only thing that I took from all of that experience was I was trained in mechanical drawing and able to take that talent and gift and use it to further me in life. And and so, you know, it, it, it's amazing. You know, the magic is always there if you recognize it. I didn't know at the time well, I was more interested in the boys, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that kind of informed Jim's work and life mentality is, is – you know, the next thing led to the next thing. I always, I always have discussions with people, you know, talking about biography where they say, well, you know, you write all your books in chronological order. Um, and I say, well, that's really the only way I know how to do it. But with somebody like Jim Henson in particular, and Lucas is kind of this way and Seuss is this way, you kind of have to do it in chronological order because the project they're working on at that moment defines what the next one is. The lessons learned, uh -huh. the failures from it, the successes inform the next thing. And that was, you know, so, you, you know, you're talking about the mechanical drawing. I think, you know, Jim, in, in, in you know, taking, um, you know, home ec, he, I don't even think he thought about it. He was like, this is the tool I need to get to the next step. And my next step is I want to be either a production designer or, okay, I have this great gig on TV. Maybe I can work with that. So Jim was always looking ahead to kind of the next thing. And what he was doing then it, it, it was it, it's so interesting when he finally gets to you know for for example once he finally gets it takes him a long time to get to the Muppet Show so he's got essentially like two failed pilots he makes a pitch to CBS that that's not picked up 
He's fortunate finally in that Lord Grade over in the UK says, come over here and film it over here. By the time Jim gets that show, it's, it's the biggest show in the world, and Jim's ready to move on already. Um, you know, by the time he gets the thing he's after, he's already looking for the next thing. So, you know, he gets the Muppet yeah. show. It's on the air. It's on the air five years. And this is such a Jim Henson word. He says, it was a really nice show. I love, I love that word. It's a nice show. Takes it off the air. Height of its powers. He could have kept that show on five more years because he wants to go. But you know, he, 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 he made sense though. He had it on for a hundred, a hundred episodes so he knew it was going to go into reruns and so that there would be <laughs> right. revenue coming from that. So, yeah, I mean, but, he, but, but he, wants, but he, yeah, he wants, but he wants to, now he wants to go do movies. You know, he wants to go do Dark Crystal. He wants to do, you know, and he gets onto that and he's like, okay, I'm done with it. Now I would like to go do um, a show that will stop war. So let's go to Fraggle Rock. Like he's, he's always ready to, he has, he has this really cool, I guess, ability to walk away. You know, he's, He's always looking for the next thing. And it's not that he's distracted or it's not that he's not focused on what he's doing, but he, you know, it, it, it's something, he's always striving for something. Once he gets to it, he's like, this is great. Um, now I can take all the lessons I learned from getting to this and go do something that's even neater than this. And that was kind of the yeah. trajectory of his career. And so, and so that's why it, it is always one of those games you play when he died is what would have happened next? Because look at like just the leapfrog steps he's taking all along, all the lessons he's learned, all the tools he's playing with. Where would he have gone next? Um, and that's, oh that's like I said, that, that's the Muppet Parlor game that we all play. Is what would Jim have done? Um, and the answer to that is we don't know. I mean, that's what makes him Jim Henson. Is he? He? We, we have no idea. You know? Do you remember in the book? There's that one where he talks about I want to do a movie where the, I want to try to make a movie where the audience can pick what happens. And then based on yeah, their decision, the, the like, ending. you see the next yeah. part of the movie. And, 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 you, and you just you can't do it. Like, the tech isn't there. Well, now it's like, I mean, it's kind of like playing a video game. Like, your decisions you make in a video game determine the flow of the game. Um, you know, it's uh-huh. like, that, that, that was Jim sort of advancing the technology. And so, like, Jim always had that ability to come up with these really cool ideas. And a lot of times the tech wasn't even ready for him. Um, and he had to kind of abandon the project until the tech came later. So, so that's that, that's one of the fun and frustrating things about his life and ending as abruptly as it did. Because you're like, where, where? Once you got Disney, once you got there, and you had all those resources at your disposal. Where would he have gone? And as I said, we just, I, I don't know. I just don't know where he would have gone. Well, you know why? Because he went there. Because he does. Yeah, because he'd already done. He it. went. Sure. He, no, he went there. Wherever it was, it was beyond this yeah. dimension. I, he's probably driving somebody crazy someplace else. Um, <laughs> probably driving too fast someplace, and yeah. Oh yeah. Buying, no, exotic, I, I, buying I, exotic, buying exotic art, and re, refinishing his apartment. Probably, I, I would say <laughs> that that um, that probably this this reality just didn't have enough room for him and so he found him one that did i think that uh he was a magical person for sure and and a joy to be around anybody who spent time with him or even better yet worked for him um probably has has a part of him as a part of them i mean knowing how well he worked with people how he treated them well and and allowed them to you know gave them the the time to develop what they needed to develop in order to be successful. I mean, um, that's a gift. And if people then turn that gift around and give it to other people, I mean, it it just uh, it snowballs the gift. Well, and and that's one of the things that was I thought again really really beautiful about it. At the end of the book, you remember there's Jocelyn Stevenson who was one of the writers of Fraggle Rock. She tells at Jim's memorial service in London. She told that great story, comparing everybody to um, <clears throat> uh, seas on a dandelion. You know, he, he said, we're, yeah. "She said we're all we're all the you know we're all the seeds on the dandelion, and we were all together with Jim, and now he's gone, and we're seeds in the wind. You know, but we're as you put it, we're Jim seeds. You know, we're carrying everything we learned." Um, with us, and wherever we land, we'll plant and grow. Um, really, uh-huh. really, really beautiful. Um, and I and I think that's what a lot of people 
you know, still talk about with Jim, what did you take away from that? And people, you know, Bill Prady, who did, you know, Bill, you know, did, I think, Big Bang Theory. He, you know, he worked for Jim at one point and they just, they all talk about just the way of, the way of his working and, you know, then, and, uh, you know, t- treating people well, like a lot of the performers all said, you know, he was, he, he just, he always made sure he, tr- that he treated everybody well. You know, there's the great story. One of the stories that I love in the book, it almost chokes me up every time to talk about it. This is performer Jerry Nelson, who had the daughter who had cystic fibrosis. And at one point, uh-huh. the Henson Company, the Henson Company's insurance provider said, um, you know, we're not, we're not going to cover her anymore. Um, you know, she's expensive. And, <laughs> and Jerry came in and, you know, and was talking about that and just said, well, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna change the company's insurance provider then. And Jerry was so, so taken aback, so speechless. And so grateful, and Jim looked at him and just says, "Jerry, that's what insurance companies are for." <laughs> you know, it just you know, I mean, who who would change the entire insurance company of their organization to make sure they covered somebody's child? I mean, Jim would. Um, we kind of wish everybody would. That's the way he was, and that's the way he ran his company, and that's the way he ran his life, and that's the way he ran his work. Um, you know, Jim loved the fun in the work. You know, it, it, it's so interesting to me. Jim, Jim didn't understand. Um, Jim loved to work so much, and he writes in his diary at one point that he just doesn't understand why everybody doesn't love to work. And, you know, you read that, and you're like, well, we're all not <laughs> working with the Muppets all day. <laughs> you know? we're, we're, not, we're not sitting across from Frank Oz as he's making us crack up as Fozzie Bear. Um, but, but, you know, that's really the way Jim was. For him, work was a joy. Um, he loved to work, and he loved doing good work, and he loved doing important work. And that, that's one of the ways they got him on Sesame Street, because at that point in his career, he's like, I don't want to be the children's performer. You know, I'm, I'm trying uh-huh. to do a lot of different things. I don't want to be, I don't want to be pigeonholed as a children's performer. And, it, but then he took a step back, and he's like, you know what? I want television to matter, and I want television to be doing something good, which is teaching kids, educating kids, this is the way to do it. Um, so, so for him, the work always had to kind of matter as well. It had to be great work, but he really wanted that work to matter. And again, that's something that, especially nowadays, I think we can all really lean into, um, you know, can, can the work, can the work matter? Does the work matter? Can you make it matter? I mean, that's, you know, if if a lot of performers would say, you know, they still ask themselves, what would Jim do? I mean, what would Jim do? And a lot of things is try to figure out a way to, to make the work matter. And fun. Well, absolutely. Know, it, like I said, that that was always that was always the, the first the first criteria. And again, not all of us are lucky enough to have fun work, but um, you know, try to find the joy in it if you can. I think Jim, I think Jim would say, can, can you find the joy in it someplace? Is there somebody in your workplace who's funny? You know, put your desk over by there if you can. So uh, you know, Jim Jim really you know he really he loves to work. He loves making it fun. And people always talked about how the best thing that you could do. Is if you could make Jim laugh, your year was made. They said just making him laugh, just you were so happy if you could do that. Well, and he was he was all for it too. I just noticed our time. Um, we've we've managed to talk ourselves through <clears throat> two hours here. Um, yeah. I I, I I I so appreciate your spending time and and bending your schedule so that, that we could do this. And I will warn everybody that you're coming back to do Dr. Seuss with me sometime next year. Uh, I, and I want your listeners to know as well, Barbara, how much I appreciate you bending your schedule as well. So I really appreciate it. Oh, that's, that's one of the benefits of, you know, being the one in charge. But it is late, yeah. Um, if, if they want to find you, if they want a uh, website, email, what would you like to put out there so they can find your material? Um, you can always find me running my mouth on Twitter under uh, Brian J. Jones. Just spell out my middle name. Otherwise, you get the dead Rolling Stone. Uh, my website's the same thing, www.brianjjones.com. I'm on, okay. I'm on Instagram, but I'm, ter- I'm terrible at Instagram. So look for me mostly on Twitter. That's where I'm causing the most trouble. <laughs> Well, I so appreciate your cause of trouble here tonight, and I'm I'm hopeful people will pick up your book and read it. It is um, it's one of those great books if you love to read because it's big, but it's worth every page. So um, the other thing I will tell people is, uh, you and I talked about this at one point. 
keep the book in one hand and your desk, your laptop in the other with YouTube open because you're going to want to, as as you go through the book, you're going to want to go find the variety show appearances, the Sesame Street sketches, these Muppet Show sketches, and it's gotten to the point where most of them you can probably find on YouTube now. That wasn't true even three or four years ago, but most stuff is out there, whether it's actually officially sanctioned or not. You can find almost everything I talk about in the book you can find online, including his just absolutely gorgeous and heartbreaking memorial service. Ah, okay. Definitely everybody do that. Thank you for being here so much and spending your time with us and sharing your your wonderful experience of writing this, and I will talk to you again soon. Well, Barbara, it's so great to talk to you. I was just telling somebody that I, I couldn't wait to get I said, Barbara asked us the best questions. She's so much fun to talk to, so I really appreciate you having me on again, and I look forward to uh, round three with us. <laughs> me too. Take care now and have a great one. And everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this will be up on YouTube shortly, and um, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. And we will talk to you next week when um, we'll be back again. Take care now. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.